The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hello, and welcome back to Workbench Wednesdays. The venerable 555 is a favorite among engineers. Even with as popular as this chip is, it isn't one that I understood in depth. Now, Karen did make an excellent series of videos on the 555 and even went into the internal operation of the chip. Which reminds me to remind you that over on the Element 14 community, you can find links to those tutorials and show notes for this episode. In this video, I grab my DMM and oscilloscope to explore how a 555 timer works with some hands-on measurements. Let's go measure. To make these measurements, I am using the 555 timer board from my video that explains how voltage affects a ceramic capacitor's value. It is an A-stable multivibrator, or known as an oscillator, or simply a clock. Although, looking at its output, most people probably wouldn't say this is a clock because the duty cycle is not exactly 50%. We are going to explore why later. Back when I designed this board, I left spots for these surface mount test points. These are pretty cool little parts, so I put a link to them in the show notes. They are not what I would call cheap, but they are great for attaching a scope probe. Or four, like in this case. On the board, I am probing the 555's VCC, threshold and trigger, discharge, and output pins. As a starting point, here's the square wave output of our circuit. It has a frequency around 455 Hz, with a positive duty cycle around 88%, and a negative duty cycle just about 12%. One of the questions I always have when using a 555 timer circuit is why isn't that output 50%? If you look in the datasheet, there are formulas to calculate the time on and time off. However, all you need to do is look at the circuit's schematic or look at the signals from the 555 chip on a scope to understand why that duty cycle looks like that. Before looking at the other signals, let's briefly review a block diagram for the 555. Between VCC and ground is the infamous three resistor voltage divider, which sets the level thresholds on two internal comparators. Those comparators operate the flip-flop, which drives the output stage. The threshold pins comparator causes the flip-flop to toggle when the signal reaches two thirds of VCC, while the trigger pins comparator causes the flip-flop to toggle when its voltage reaches one third of VCC. This behavior is critical because in an A-stable multivibrator, these two pins are connected together. Last, notice that the discharge pin is also controlled by the flip-flop. For measurements, let's first talk about that voltage divider. Here we see about 420 kilo ohms. Measuring from VCC to pin five should be a single resistor. And the DMM sees about 160 kilo ohms, which is roughly one third of 420. Inside of the IC, I'm not exactly sure what's going on. They could be using a resistor structure, or they might be using like transistors as a Thevenin's equivalent to get to that resistor divider. So a better measurement would be to apply voltage and see how it changes across the network. Here, I'm applying 10 volts to VCC and ground. By measuring from pin five to ground, we should see two thirds of VCC, and we get about 6.5 volts, which is pretty close to two thirds. Now, you might be thinking about how the 555 was named after the three five kilo ohm resistors, but we measured 160 kilo ohms, so what gives? Well, first, that's actually a myth. The original product manager for the 555 dispelled it a long time ago. And second, I have another 555 that actually measures around 17 kilo ohms total with about five kilo ohms for one resistor. If you're not sure why there's a difference, go check out the episode on essential ICs and active components they have in your kit because there is a hint in that video. Okay, now that we saw the divider, let's go back to the timer circuit and measure some of the signals. With my scope probes hooked up, on the scope we can see that the yellow trace is VCC, which is around 10 volts. The green trace is the threshold and trigger pins. Remember, they're connected together in our circuit. The blue trace is the discharge pin, and the orange trace is the output, which we looked at earlier. Zooming in just a little bit, we can see a single cycle of the waveform. The cursor marks when the output goes high. 
Notice that when that happens, the green signal starts to charge up. When it hits its peak, the discharge pin goes low very quickly and the output goes low as well. And then the green trace starts to discharge. The key to the A-stable multi-vibrator is this green signal. Changing to horizontal cursors, we can see the peak-to-peak -peak voltage of the green waveform. It goes up to about 6.69 or 6.7 volts and down to right about 3 volts. Those numbers should sound familiar. Because two-thirds of 10 volts is about 6.66666666666666, you get the idea. And one-third is about 3 volts, you can see that the trigger and threshold signal is just bouncing between two-thirds and one-third of VCC, which is why this signal is oscillating. The answer to why the output's waveform isn't 50% is in the green trace. Notice that it takes very long for it to charge up, and then it discharges very quickly. Let's go back to the block diagram of the 555 and the schematic of our circuit to see why. Inside the output stage is an inverter. So when output is high, the transistor on the discharge pin is off. When that pin is off, the circuit's timing capacitor is charged through RA and RB. In this case, that is 7.8 kilo ohms. When pin 6 hits about 6.6 .6 volts, the flip-flop toggles, causing the transistor on the discharge pin to turn on, providing a path for the timing capacitor to discharge. However, it only discharges through RB. The ratio of RA and RB determines the output duty cycle. In this circuit, it takes about 8 times longer for the timing cap to charge up to 2 thirds VCC than it does to discharge to 1 third VCC. And frankly, until I saw those waveforms with this circuit, I really didn't have a good understanding of what was happening with the 555. The magic really is what happens with those trigger and threshold signals. At this point, we could change the resistor and capacitor values to see how it changes the waveform. If that's something that you're interested in seeing, let me know over on the Element 14 community. In this episode, we review the 555 timer's block diagram, answered why the duty cycle isn't always 50%, and verified its operation with a DMM and an oscilloscope. I don't know about you, but I feel like that turned out to be a lot for such a simple circuit. Remember that over on the Element 14 community, there are show notes for this episode, which includes links related to the 555. By the way, that is the best place to ask me questions because I am more likely to see them. For now, it is time for me to get back to relaxation oscillations around my electronics workbench. <laughs>